Hey guys, this is part five. And in this part, since this is a new day, I'm going to clarify what I forgot to mention in the other four videos. And for that, so we can start off right away, you can see the three identifying marks and I'm always telling my viewers to look at the detail because the fake swords out there do not have detail. They have the outline and uh, like, let's say this, it has a flower, like the fake ones, they have flowers, but they don't have the little lines on the inside of the flower or the little circle inside there. Again with these, same same thing. No detail on the ones that are fake, but the real ones do have all this detail. Um, so, moving on, I want to bring up that in World War II, the most rare or scarce sword or swords um, are the navy swords. You might be asking why? Well, the simplest thing to say or answer is in World War II, um, most of the navy swords were sunk to the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Why? Because our allies and the United States Navy sunk the Japanese, um, you know, the Japanese carriers battleships and all this so basically that's why the navy swords are they're pretty rare they're very rare uh, i'm going to show you pictures and a lot more stuff to clarify what i was talking about so hopefully this part this part five won't take as long as all the other uh all the other four videos over 15 minutes this one should be pretty fast so it's just I like I said I want to clarify certain things that I forgot to mention so anyway um, so let's go look at that so, as I was saying, okay, it's a little blurry here because the picture's blurry, <laughs> but oh well, uh, you get the majority of the idea. So this navy sword on top here is the most common because this is the very early navy sword the one on the bottom here is the one that i have the mid-war production okay now let's go to the next picture this right here is on an arasaka a japanese rifle that mark that you see there that is for training purposes. It's a training mark. That's a family crest mark. It's on a naval sword. And you can see the, nav the navy mark, the anchor mark on the sepa, on the inside the flower. Next, this is a... <coughs> Excuse me. This is a uh, suba for people that worked for the Japanese military, but were not in the military. This is open guard work, this one right there. This is a pretty rare handguard. There they're talking about the button on the side. That's you could say it's a family crest, a mum. Okay, these are other mums, uh, samurai 
family crests. These are other markings that you want to look for when you're buying uh, real Japanese swords. You can see there's one, uh, there's I think four different types of navy markings. The ones that we have, that I have, is number seven. There's a, there's that one, number 18, that's a lone uh, navy mark. But I'm just showing you so you guys will understand. Okay. This is the copper version, NCO sword. That's the first one. Then we have this one here, the second one, like I told you guys. The one that I have wrapped up in 550 cord. <laughs> and then there's the, the third example. I also have that one. This is the fourth. This is the fifth and sixth. And they're both wooden handles. These are both last ditch efforts. Okay. Now this is what I want to really bring up here so that nobody can say, well, you didn't specify. Okay, here it is. This is a traditional way of making the samurai sword. You have the master and you have his uh, assistants, his students learning from him and they're hammering the, the sword out. Okay, so that's traditional made. This is in color. Master, students, hammering out the sword. This is machine made. You have one guy, one man or woman in World War II with a machine hammer hammering out the, the steel to make the, the sword. And again, like from far away, the machine is pounding out the, the metal to make the sword. This is a machine, but you can still see that they're making it handmade. So those of you that are like, oh, you know, that's not true. Yeah, there it is. There's the pictures right there. You can't argue with the pictures. Anyway, after the machine made or the traditional made, the smith signs the tang if he chooses to. If it's a real nice blade, they will. Okay, right here, this is a, a kamikaze pilot, and he has his sword right there. You can see it. Okay, moving on. These are the other sword, I'm sorry, the other markings for the, the Japanese bayonets and rifles. This is a very rare mark. If you have that mark, wow, you have a lottery right there. Okay, so I hope this one helps you. This here is for the NCO swords. These are the markings on the NCO swords. Again, you cannot argue with these pictures. 
this is what they mean you can google it I would advise you to anyway and that's it those are all the markings for the NCO sword and this here are for the tangs the handmade or machine made tangs and that's it now we go back to the table so I could say one more thing that I wanted to bring up <laughs> okay so the reason I'm making this video is because well my girlfriend told me to actually clear up what I was trying to say in the other four videos and that was eh, trying to get comfortable here sorry tables a little squeaky <laughs> but anyway that is that what is it um, lost my train of thought there for a minute <laughs> I want to talk about the stainless steel blades the the Japanese did have stainless steel that's why we have these swords here that are stainless steel so let me just open a little bit not too much but so you can see just the blade itself so yeah they did have stainless steel but it was not the stainless steel that when you think about stainless steel, it's not like as good as today's stainless steel. They were testing it. They were developing the stainless steel to resist the salt water in the Navy. That's why the Navy, most of the Japanese Navy swords were made out of stainless steel. Uh, but again, it was low quality stainless steel. And that's why on this sword here, on the blade uh, it does have some rust on it. it it's not very good but it's still um, how do I say it's still stainless steel compared to the other uh, non stainless steel swords out there it is very well done they did a great job making this steel again it's something to do with the chemicals that they were using or dipping into the the what is it the the steel itself um, it's hard to explain but again they did have stainless steel but it's not as good as today's stainless steel <laughs> so that's one thing I really wanted to mention and clarify in my other videos but I kept forgetting because I was talking about you know World War two and that these swords have been through war and uh, a lot of people they they get all pissed off or they not pissed off but they make such a big deal when the Kasaki or if the blade has chips on it and they're like oh it has a chip and the Kasaki's missing and all this stuff and it's like do you even realize that these swords have been through war actual blood spilt horrifying war it was not a picnic you know so that really makes me upset it's like these things these swords were actually some cases or at least in most cases in the Japanese military they were used okay used I don't want to get into all that because that's where the arguments start but anyway um, I just wanted to bring that up uh, I wanted to clarify that so I hope this video did help somebody out there. And uh, again, uh, thank you for watching. This is Ronin246 channel and is out. Take care, guys. Bye.